Here are some revenue recognition examples regarding the right of return and repurchase agreements. Companies recognize that their customers may not always be satisfied with the product and usually provide the ability to return it within so many days, etc. This right of return is guaranteed for certain products under the company's policy. When that happens, the customer can receive anything from full or partial refund or credit in the store or another product in exchange for the returned product. Beyond that, sometimes there's repurchase agreements where a company sells items but agrees that they will repurchase the ones that are not sold after a certain period of time. Or there's other purchase agreements where they agree to buy the product back at a higher cost. When that happens, when it's repurchased at greater than or equal to the sales price, it's considered a financing transaction. So for this example, there were 200 units sold and each unit cost $45 to make but was being sold at $80. Returns can be made up until 50 days and there was an estimate that four units would be returned and that those products would be resold. So little pieces that we know of, we know that 200 units were sold at $80 a piece, so that means there's $16,000 in cash that was received, or receivables. We also know that they expect that there will be four units returned and that they have to pay the customers back at $80 a piece, so that is $320 that's expected to be delivered back to the customer. What needs to occur is we need to show that we're going to receive the cash of $16,000 and that we're going to estimate a liability for the $320. The difference amount, the $15,680, is what's going to be record at, recorded as revenue at the time of the sale. We also know that of the 200 units sold, and they cost $45 a piece, that that's a $9,000 decrease in inventory. We're not going to record it all as cost of goods sold yet because if we estimate that we're going to have to return some of it and we're not recording revenue for those four items we estimate as return, then we're not really going to transfer them to cost of goods sold. We're going to take them out of inventory because they're not available for sale at the moment, but we are going to put them in an estimated inventory return item, which is going to be an asset. And here's what that entry looks like. Cash of 16000 was received. That was the 200 units times $80 a piece. The refund liability is the estimate that we're going to have four returns where we're going to owe the customers their $80 back. And the difference is what we're going to recognize as revenue. In inventory, we had 200 units removed from inventory that cost $45 a piece. So we've got to take them out of inventory. We do estimate that four items that cost $45 a piece are going to be returned and they're going to be put back in inventory. So that's our estimated inventory returns treated as an asset for the moment. And what's left over is going to be what we, what we record as cost of goods sold. So that's the entry for a simple right of return. What happens is only three units are returned. So we really end up only returning $80 times three or $240. And what we end up doing is debiting refund liability for 240 and crediting accounts payable for the amount we owe the customers of $240. We also have to go ahead and record the return of the inventory. So we could have returned inventory or sales returns, and we have that amount that we had asked, debited as an asset, that estimated inventory returns. Well, we estimated four items would be returned. We put it in as an asset, so we're going to credit estimated inventory returns and that's going to be for three items times the cost of $45 or $150.
Now let's just look at a regular agreement to repurchase inventory that's unsold at the end of a specified period of time. So here there were sales of 200000 that cost 183000 and anything not sold would be repurchased in two years. This is just your typical entry that you've been making all along in your accounting classes. You simply debit cash or accounts receivable and credit sales revenue for the sales price and debit cost of goods sold and credit inventory for the cost of the asset. Nothing unusual for this transaction. Now imagine there was an agreement to sell an asset. So I will sell my customer an asset for $200,000 and in two years I will buy it back at $242,000. That gives an imputed interest rate of 10%. And it's not really a sale, it's a financing agreement. I'm really giving them collateral, they're giving me 200000 and I'm going to give them 10% interest compounded annually. So after the end of two years, I will give them $242,000. So as a regular borrowing agreement, I would debit cash and credit the liability. And that's what I'm going to do in this case. I debit cash and I would credit accounts payable, contract payable, etc., but a liability to the company. And I would do this for the 200000 the original amount of the sale. If I don't know the amount, I'd have to back it in and come up with the present value at the time of the sale. At the end of one year, I've got principal times rate times time. $200,000 times 10% times one year, interest is $20,000. That gives me a debit to interest expense and a credit to the liability. Notice at this point my liability is now $220,000. So I have my original $200,000 in the sale, $20,000 I've recorded at interest, that's $220,000. At the end of the year, my interest expense is $22,000. So I'm going to debit interest expense and credit my liability for $22,000. And now it's the time where I owe the money. So I'm going to debit the liability to get rid of that and credit cash for the $242,000. So again, this is a financing agreement. It's really not a sale. So there really isn't revenue to recognize.